Most jails in the United States prohibit treating inmates for opioid use disorder with medications such as buprenorphine or methadone. As a result, patients may have painful opioid withdrawal symptoms when they enter jail and their treatment is stopped. Or they may self-treat withdrawal, which can create other medical risks. I'm Stephen Morrissey, Managing Editor of the New England Journal of Medicine, and I'm talking with Ingrid Binswanger, a senior investigator at the Institute for Health Research at Kaiser Permanente, Colorado, and an associate professor of internal medicine at the University of Colorado School of Medicine. Dr. Binswanger has written a perspective article about the consequences of disruptions in treatment for opioid use disorder during incarceration. Dr. Binswanger, how often do you see patients who have to stop taking medications for opioid use disorder or who don't get medication that could benefit them while they're incarcerated? It's been common that I've seen these patients with this scenario both when I worked in a methadone clinic as well as in my current practice where predominantly we treat patients with buprenorphine. It's not every day, certainly, that we see these cases, but they're common enough and they raise enough clinical dilemmas that I worry about it. We work very hard to ensure that patients who are started on treatment continue to have access to that treatment, and we try to provide services to them in a timely way. And it's difficult when I have a patient who's stable on treatment, and they may face some kind of interruption for any number of reasons, one of which is potentially incarceration. Then we have to think through, is it worth trying to reduce the dose of the medication? What are the risks associated with reducing the dose? How uncomfortable will the patient be, and is it even medically appropriate to reduce the dose? One of the things that I worry about is that there's not really any time or any evidence that suggests that there's a safe or appropriate time to stop medications for opioid use disorder. There are a lot of potential risks associated with that, and so I worry that it's not safe to stop people's treatment in anticipation of a jail stay. So given all of that, why have jails traditionally not allowed most inmates to receive medications for opioid use disorder? I think there are a number of barriers to continuing treatment in jails. I think some jails are concerned about things like cost or potentially that individuals may divert medications or they may be concerned that they don't really understand why the medications are necessary, particularly if people are incarcerated for a long period of time. But I think overall, There have been a lot of efforts at some facilities, for example, in Denver County, they've been trying to implement medication treatment for opioid use disorder through pilot programs, and I think this has also been done in other places such as Rhode Island. So there are a lot of efforts that are being made now by jails to continue treatment. It's just been slow to start, and there's more than 3,000 jails all over the country So it's not clear that these programs have necessarily made it to all of the jails where people with opioid use disorder may get incarcerated. What are the effects on incarcerated patients if they don't have access to buprenorphine or methadone? Well, one of the things that might happen is, say, we may need to reduce the dose prior to their incarceration if it's a planned admission to jail. Of course, most admissions to jails are not planned. But in some cases, individuals do know that they will be going to jail. In those cases, we may try to taper the medication prior to going to jail. Unfortunately, one thing that might happen then is that there's a risk, of course, that people don't do well on the lower dose of medication and actually start craving opioids and potentially relapse prior to being incarcerated. That can be potentially risky, of course, because when you've lost tolerance and you take an opioid at a higher potency, you could actually overdose and potentially die. There's also, once people are incarcerated, if they go through what's sort of called forced withdrawal, where they have to come off of the medications that they're on, they could potentially also experience very uncomfortable symptoms. And there have been some reports of people in jails actually dying during periods of withdrawal from opioids. The other risks happen on the other end when people are released from jails. They could potentially overdose if they relapse after release from jail or prison. That can happen both with jails and prisons. So there's evidence that suggests that individuals released from jails and prisons have a high risk of overdose. And if you release somebody who's previously been on treatment and stable on treatment, but they don't have access to their medications anymore, that could increase the risk for them having an overdose after the release. One of the ways that this could potentially be mitigated is 
both by continuing the treatment that they were started on before being incarcerated and also by potentially giving people medication called naloxone, which can reverse an overdose at the time of release. And you could give this to individuals who both themselves use opioids or have a history of opioid use disorder or people who may be around other people who are currently using opioids or have an opioid use disorder. So that's one of the ways that you could potentially mitigate the risk of overdose after release. In your article, you talk about a recent Massachusetts court case in which the judge ruled in favor of a patient with opioid use disorder whose lawyers argued that discontinuing methadone treatment during a stay in jail would violate the Constitution and would violate the Americans with Disabilities Act. Do you expect that case is going to have broader implications for access to treatment around the country? I think that case hopefully will contribute to ensuring that people do have access to treatment in correctional facilities, both jails and prisons. There are two scenarios in which we'd like to see that people have access to treatment. One of them is if they're already on treatment prior to they being incarcerated or individuals who decide that they want treatment when they are incarcerated. So my hope is that this case can drive changes in order to ensure that people do have access to evidence-based medical treatment for opioid use disorder. Because we are in the midst of an opioid crisis, it seems like this is a particularly important time during which we need to ensure that at every opportunity, we can treat people for opioid use disorder with the medications that are most evidence-based. And at this point in time, those are largely methadone and buprenorphine. In that regard, you suggested earlier that many of these barriers to continuity of care that are faced by people in jail are also faced by people who've never been in the criminal justice system. So for those people, what are the causes of these disruptions in care and how can they be addressed? One of these reasons that this case really resonated for me is that I've heard stories from patients about the difficulties that they have both accessing care and staying in care. There are a lot of requirements for methadone treatment that are difficult. For example, you need to go in and get daily dosing at the beginning of treatment. And there's a lot of requirements for attendance, urine toxicology, and counseling. And some of these are helpful because they provide some structure to patients. On the other hand, they would be very difficult even for me to adhere to. I would find it very difficult to get to a clinic every single day at 5 o'clock or 6 o'clock in the morning prior to going to work. And so what really resonated for me about this case is that this individual struggles with staying in treatment really related to difficulty in getting to clinic. He had lost his driver's license. His family members were helping him by taking him to clinic. There was one day where his mother could not go to clinic with him because she was going to a funeral. And then he had to drive himself, despite the fact that he didn't have a license. And he was trying to adhere with all of the requirements for methadone clinic, but yet was stopped by the police for driving a little bit over the speed limit and then having a license that was suspended. And I think that this really illustrated the kinds of struggles that my patients have adhering with the many, many requirements that they need in order to stay engaged in methadone treatment and also buprenorphine treatment. It can be a lot of work and it can be difficult in scenarios where patients are also trying to maintain employment and take care of their children and get their kids to school and other factors. And those things are universal. They're not only challenges that are faced by patients who get incarcerated. So finally, given all of that, what advice would you give to individual physicians who treat patients with opioid use disorder? How can they provide high quality care given the likelihood that there'll be treatment disruptions and other barriers? I think some of the things that we really need to think about as a community of physicians who take care of opioid use disorder is what are the things that we can do to reduce the barriers to care both to accessing care and staying in care. And I think we need to think through this carefully from the perspective of patients and their broader lives and make sure that if we do place requirements on what is necessary to adhere to care, that those are truly evidence-based requirements and that we are really clear about the purpose of those requirements. And then I think some increased consistency across programs and settings would also be very helpful so that people know what to expect. 
There are researchers looking at low threshold programs for buprenorphine, for example. Those may provide some interesting or useful insights into perhaps there are a lot of requirements that we could just eliminate in order to make adhering with treatment much easier for our patients. Thank you, Dr. Binswanger.